Good evening. This would be our third underground interview with Al Bilic, coming to you directly from the American Academy of Dissident Sciences. A lot of interesting things happened after our last recording on April 16, when me and Al here organized that famous, right. famous academy, the most famous academy in the world the American Academy of Dissident Sciences. There were several conferences that we both visited. Also, we released uh, the first tape from that recording, the second underground interview with Al Bilic, which is a discussion on the Philadelphia Experiment, Nazi mind control, nukes, saucers and drugs, Illuminati bankroll, the rise of the Bolsheviks, and Nazis to power, and secretly transfer military technology to them. Also, we talk about uh, catastrophic ecological effects of the first nukes and hydrogen bombs. And finally, and probably this is the most interesting part of the whole tape, is Wilhelm Reich mind control experiments in the underground labs here in the United States. Uh, some other tapes that we have here uh, are, well, finally, we prepared the tape on the Alternative 3 film. It contains the full uh, one-hour film, a crystal clear copy that we got straight from England, and a one-hour lecture that I did at the First World UFO Conference in uh, Tucson, Arizona, in May of uh, 91. Uh, and the third tape that we have here is uh, on my favorite topic, the close encounters of the Foo Fighter kind. Uh, research and development of anti-gravity in Nazi Germany during the uh, Second World War, and subsequent research of uh, superpower alternative space programs. Uh, I'll be very glad to, if you can tell us all some new interesting developments that happened to in the last month or so, and then we'll go on with our interview about the Phoenix Project. There have been, since the April 16th date, a few more developments. Uh, of course, I've been digging in on my favorite subject, the Philadelphia Experiment, and some additional data has come to light. Uh, one of the items, which is probably of interest to those who are interested in the movie that was produced entitled The Philadelphia Experiment, finally a copy was sent to me of an article entitled On the Set of the Philadelphia Experiment. And this is a Xerox copy, of course, but it does show that there was extensive work done, about five years of uh, preparatory work, including about six screenwriters, and they finally came up with the full story as they eventually released it. And some information about the various actors. As the Navy wanted it to be released. <laughs> uh, possibly, possibly not. They got absolutely no cooperation from the Navy during the days of shooting. They had to find a, uh, literally, a naval museum in the southern states to find a ship which they could shoot on. And it was the backdrop for the Eldridge. They did eventually. And of course, when they went out to the other terminal, which should have been at Montauk, but in the movie it was shown as the uh, air base, the old abandoned air base <coughs> in Utah, that particular location, back in 8081, I had visited many times and had all of the buildings left from World War II, all the hangars, etc. So Doug Curtis comes up to the town fathers and says, we want to shoot part of our film here. And part of the film shows for uh, that we must have burned these buildings down as part of the whole operation. Do you mind? And the town father says, not in the least. We're happy to glad, I'm glad to have you burn them down because we want to get rid of them anyway. So I went over Utah's air base, who finally was stripped of its uh, old air hangars. And when I was through there in 85, 86, I noticed they were all gone. And they have some nice, shiny new office buildings there because the city of Wendover, Utah, went and moved in and built all new office buildings and converted the base to what they wanted. But the article is most interesting in that it shows a real history of the film. And I'm still digging in on this to find out the full history and where the original ideas came from. That is still not very clear. Uh, the 
title of the magazine here was Staric. And it was the August 82 issue, I believe, is what it says down there. Yeah, that's the August 19, it may be 82. Right. 1982. This was actually released before the movie. So it's sort of a historic document, pre humus not post humus But I found it very interesting to sh that there is some documentation around about the movie film, and I'm still digging in on the true history of the film, how it came to be, and so forth. There possibly may be a second version of the Philadelphia Experiment movie, but that is very nebulous at this time, and many people who claim uh, to have inside information on this, when you get back to the source, they deny it. Maybe there will be, and maybe there will not. But it's interesting that it has been considered again, and I hope if they do do a new one, that it will be much more accurate in terms of the actual history of what happened. Because there was a great deal of fill-in, as Hollywood loves to do, uh, love interest, chase through California and the whole nine yards of it. None of that actually took place, as those who've listened to my lectures know. But that part is very interesting. Now, other aspects in trying to dig into the real history of the Philadelphia Experiment and what really happened and who was involved and is, are any of these people alive today. I know three sailors are alive, but they don't want to see me or talk with me. One officer who I've talked with several times in this matter, Alan Batchelor of New York City, has talked, and he does not hide it, but he does not lecture publicly on it because he's doing other things to make a living. I've since found several other people, and until I have clearance to give their names, because they were part and parcel of the Philadelphia Experiment in 43, until I have clearance, I will not use their names. One of these people is now dead, and I don't think there's any problem in stating that Captain William Harrison was in charge of the actual observership detail, and which two separate observerships were used. One for the first test in July 22nd, and that was a smaller ship, and the final test, which was done on 12 August, involved the use of a small carrier, a jump carrier as they called it. And William Harrison was in charge of both of these um, tests in terms of the observance of what happened and what went on. How did you who, uh, shall we say, knew the facts and don't want, do not want to name this person because he might be in trouble with his employer. I've discovered the same thing, that in such conferences one can get the most interesting information from totally unexpected and... Always totally unexpected. ...people that come to you with right. literally jewels, with gems of information. Gems of information. Anything else interesting that you've discovered in the last month? Well, this goes back a few months, but uh, it's finally now published in the uh, journal out of Sedona, known as Emergence. And a lady there by the name of Helga Mauro had two articles in the current issue. And uh, this one was more or less on her mystical psychic capabilities and what she was doing. That's a fairly good likeness of her in the middle. It turns out that if you t now we'll turn to yeah. the second page because that's the important part of this now this article is detailing the history of a father Fred A. Kuppers K-U-E-P-P-E-R-S born in Germany raised and educated there and came over with family back before World War II. And he was a very strict authoritarian German. Your children do not speak unless spoken to. And then if you request perhaps something at a time to talk with the father, it has to be something intelligent or don't bother. And the request has to be submitted in writing three days. Well, not quite. Her father wasn't that strict. But the interesting part was that before he died on Lincoln's birthday in 1963, he took his daughter aside and said that I've been given 90 days to get my affairs in order and I'm going to tell you a few things you must know but you will not remember until you're about 55 years of age. Now the full details of what I'm telling you are in this article. She has chosen to come public with it and in this she tells a story of her father. The story basically is that he admitted to her he had been involved heavily in the Philadelphia a number of other government projects, and he had been not only on the moon, but in the moon. He stated that emphatically. Inside the moon? Inside the moon. Which is another 
extremely important clue of information in another crazy story that I've been pursuing about the moon being hollow. Right. And remember, he died in 1963 before we were supposed to have gotten to the moon. And he stated flatly he had been to the moon and in the moon. He also made further statements, all outlined in this article, which, uh, because it's public, I will go public on it. He stated flatly that one of his tasks for the government was to train aliens to work within our government and there were human types which were totally undetectable. It was his job to train them to work within our government. Period. Fascinating. So this further <laughs> blows the cover of uh, the party line ufologists that have been claiming for years that the biggest headache and problem for our government were exactly these human, totally human looking aliens that are indistinguishable in a crowd. Not hardly. Since they were being trained to work in our government by Mr. Uh, Fred Coopers, it uh, puts entirely, an entirely different cast on the whole situation. Now, after his 90 days were up, he went back to the hospital for his usual medical checkup, and uh, allegedly he died in the hands of a nun who they were totally could not trace afterwards. They had the standard type funeral for someone who was going to be uh, removed from the public circuit, so to speak. And as Helga remembers, very detailed, uh, very detailed memory now, when she viewed the body in the casket, she found something wrong with it. Her father always had a lot of hair on her, his fingers and the backs of his hands. The corpse had no hair on the fingers or hands. The face looked very peculiar. It looked almost waxen, as if it was a wax mold. And though pictures were taken of the uh, actual funeral, she was not allowed to see the pictures ever. Apparently still held by somebody else in the family. So they had the funeral, the whole thing was over. And two months later, one night when she was in bed, she gets a visit. A very physical visit, not a ghost. First she thought it was a ghost, and it was her father. He came and sat down on the edge of her bed, left a normal impression of a person who has an appropriate weight on the mattress, talked with her for a period of time, and uh, told her, he says, you wanted to see me, so I'm letting you know that I am well and okay, and I'm living in another dimension, in another domain. He said, it's very difficult for me to come here, and it's very painful to go back. But he said, nevertheless, I wanted to come here and reassure you of a few things. And he says, if you really need me sometime, I'll come back. According to her, he has returned once to her and once to another family relative. I believe it was her mother. So her opinion is that he came as a ghost form and solidified in a material form, or that he secretly worked for a governmental program and was even by well, the one night? He was uh, not hit by a car one night. He went through the normal dying in the hospital, according to the records. And when he appeared to her in the bedroom, he was very solid. You couldn't see through him. He was just like a normal person. He could shake her hand. He could smell the normal cologne he used, the tobacco he smoked. And after about an hour or so, he says, I've got to go now. And he got up and walked over towards the wall and disappeared in a beam me up Scotty number, exactly like Joan on Star Trek. And she swore that this happened and that this was the way he disappeared. Now the mystery deepens even further. So she term. wasn't driven by a car to the place of no, she would happen. his daughter, but no. he was beamed down. He was beamed down or beamed through or whatever you want to call it to her bedroom where he could talk with her and then he left from there to return to wherever he returned to. Now, most interestingly, a few weeks ago, she called me and says, I have absolute proof that he's still alive. I says, what do you mean? He said, I have some technical papers published in Germany, translated to English, of work that he's done with a certain German professor in Germany. And there are three or four papers with his name attached to it, Fred Kutters. She called the head man at the university where he was alleged to be working and asked him, is this so-and-so and so-and-so? Well, yes. Who are you? I'm his daughter. And I want to know certain things about physical details. And he confirmed them and said there was no question that this was her father. He says, I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. I says, well, I would like copies of certain papers. He says, why? He says, because I want them for my grandchildren's scrapbook. Oh, in that case, you can have them. And she had received them. They were sent to her in the mail, and I obtained copies. And they're highly technical papers dealing with uh, magnetometers and magnetic field mapping and magnetic field measurements, all of them in Germany, and all of them taking place in a German university. It's curious because he went through the German university system in the first place, and apparently he has returned there. Which is another little sign that German... Germany and Japan and Russia and the other superpowers are in on the secret space.
troubles with the coast. They're on to so much secret South stuff. It's on to so much secret stuff that's unbelievable as to what they've done and what they've accomplished. About his going to the moon, I'm extremely cu curious. Was he in a cave inside the moon or was he in a more cavernous internal structure? That I cannot answer because uh, he did not give her any information. He merely stated he'd been on and in the moon and did not elaborate insofar as Helga knows. And I'm quoting, of course, I've talked with her privately long before this article was published and never said anything, but now that it's published, I will talk about it. But it's detailed and it gives a lot of information, background of the family and a few other things. And, of course, raises the serious question, what did the government really do? Uh, obviously, he was part of one of these protected witnesses programs, given apparently for a period of time a new identity moved to another location. But now he turns up with his true identity in Germany working at a university, which is even more bizarre. That doesn't normally happen. But these papers were written about 1980, in that time frame, 79, 80. And I don't have them with me, or I could show the titles, but I don't want to create a major furor over this. But perhaps at a future time I can do this. I did not think of bringing those with me unless they're in this envelope, which I can check. But there's a lot of background data there involving uh, Helga, what she's been through. Her memory was wiped and erased until a few years ago, at the time about the age of 55, when she was told, no, I don't have those with me. I got some spare copies for you. Next time. And uh, she has been thoroughly involved in trying to find out the real history of her father. And she is finding out more and more. And her memory of those period, a period of time when he told her so many things and said, you will forget this until you're about 55. Then you will remember it, and you will also become one of the world's greatest psychics. And he also told her on tears that he says, I'm very sorry about the way I treated you when you were a young girl. He says, I had to do that and to be stern. But this is what the party required from me. And That's I had to precisely follow my party call. Precisely. Fascinating. Uh, but he did say this. He said, I wish I could tell you who I really am, but I can't. Hmm. Which indicates there's a still deeper part of this mystery. Uh, I remember we talked about that in the... No, actually, we didn't. We'll be talking about this in this tape, about you and your brother Duncan going to Mars through the Phoenix time tunnel right. technology, going to the insides of Mars, penetrating the inside chambers there, and I see a similarity here that the government being unable to go into uh, these inside chambers left by past dead or departed civilizations on these planets, uh, finally they were able to, through these beaming down technology, even the more advanced Phoenix time tunnel technology through the time portal, to move the portal right in, in the inside of the cavern and to explore it. And this further confirms, or this adds one more little rumor for me about uh, the speculations that actually the moon is a uh, ship that was driven, a, a starship driven and parked in orbit around the moon, even an abandoned starship. Some stories say that in past history there were two moons orbiting our planet and probably the occupants of the first and heavily damaged ship, or should we call it a, <laughs> a, a battle planet. Uh, uh, they just build themselves a new one and depart it. But that's another story for a very, for a very long speculation. Uh, it's known that the Americans did experiments in bumping abruptly at the moon's surface at the expanded uh, landing module, the cabin of the lunar landing module after the astronauts jogged back on their way to Earth with the uh, Apollo spacecraft in lunar orbit. So by dropping that cabin at a much steeper angle t in, in, and, and crashing it into the surface, they, u they, they used that as a test explosion. And they measured on the seismographs they, they left on the moon's surface uh, the was created and it turned out that the moon reverberated for uh, many hours uh, it was a reverberation signal much much longer 
the, the atten attenuation was very little, which can be explained only by the fact that if the moon is a hollow sphere made of titan titanium. So uh, I wouldn't be amazed that similar projects have been uh, done with the pyramids here on our planet and that all the chambers of interest have been long ago penetrated by <laughs> the powers to be. Uh, I would like to actually just to say three words about our previous tape that we did and to basically introduce the discussion into the contents of uh, our next interview. We talked about basically the Philadelphia project, how it developed starting with the invisib invisibility project at the uh, University of Advanced Studies at Princeton going through the Rainbow Project and finally ending with the Philadelphia experiment of uh, radar and optical invisibility for a ship and as an unexpected byproduct and bonus from these experiments basically time travel and teleportation was discovered. Uh, and these technologies, although the experiment had a disastrous end in uh, 42, in 43, when a lot of the sailors were either missing or were totally deranged after they got exposed on the deck on the top of the ship through these heavy radiations. Later on, this technology was perfected uh, so that uh, time travel, teleportation, and invisibility could, have, uh, could be achieved at ease, basically, in a dial a destination procedure on the main ship's computer in the late 40s, early 50s, and 60s. And right now, uh, as uh, Al and many other sources have said, basically all nuclear-powered carriers and uh, the stealth bombers and fighters have this portable Philadelphia technology of invisibility, teleportation, and time travel. So uh, with this behind us, I would like to basically steer the discussion into the next big project, the Phoenix uh, slash Montauk project and uh, all the subsequent experiments with travel in the universe with a technology that is way more advanced, advanced even uh, than the teleportation technology. This is the, t the technology of the time tunnel, or the time portal, this tentacle that can be spread from between any two points in our galaxy or universe and transfer a human being, a celestial being, or a <laughs> cargo or material to a base on a different planet. Right. You know, that was the final phases of the Phoenix Project. It was sometimes called the Montauk Project for the simple reason that the master control point and the major research was done at the base at Montauk. And that was, of course, originally known during World War I as Fort Hero, an Army base, also Navy, because they had two underwater submarine pens, which were there operational until 1983. But during the period of time between World War I and World War II, it was still a military base. When World War II was over, it eventually the Air Force came in and used it for a period of time for experimental radar systems. And eventually a SAGE system was installed about 1963. Some 25 of these were installed around the U.S. operational. And 68, 69, they phased them out for the simple reason that they now had something better, the Dewline project, and then eventually the BMUs which were across northern Canada, and it was felt that we, the detection capability of over-the-horizon radar with those systems was far superior to the ones which were called the SAGE projects. So the SAGE projects were shut down and abandoned, and the Air Force and the military walked out of these bases and left them surplus. And they were carried on uh, General Administrative Services roster, particularly Montauk and most of the others, as surplus property abandoned they didn't know what to do with it, and they didn't do anything with it until 1986, which was after the project had collapsed. But in that environment of a collapsed base with all of the uh, buildings there, an underground facility which had been built in the period of about 1928 to 31, which is somewhat getting ahead of the story, but nevertheless, they had a perfect facility for doing what they wanted to do. Even probably earlier, because I remember you mentioned this yeah. Fort Hero underground submarine base with yes. underwater entries of the submarine Correct. Tent. Correct. That goes back to World War I, and it says basically 1917 or a little earlier. Now, there was only one level at that time from people we've talked with who were involved in the later construction 
of underground, and the area at the extreme eastern tip of Long Island, called Montauk Point, was essentially flat. About 1928 through 3031, the Army Corps of Engineers comes in and other contractors, and they build five additional levels above the original low one, and after they completed all the construction, and all of the elevators, shafts, and all of the other work which got them from one level to another. They covered everything over with tons and tons of dirt, planted trees, shrubs, and grass, and made it look like this grassy knoll, no pun intended, uh, this hill had been there forever. And it was a perfect disguise, completed in 31. Who gave a hoot as to what went on at Montauk in 1931? The only people out there at that time was the lighthouse keeper from the Montauk Lighthouse. I would like to add here a little comment. It's fascinating for me to discover the precursors of certain secretive developments uh, of our present days. Uh, for example, it took Bill Cooper many years, several years, to uh, convince the large public, the public at large, of the existence of uh, massive underground research and development installations of massive underground Frankensteinian factories for genetic research. Uh, but we discovered that, uh, I was astonished myself to discover that similar massive underground facilities existed in Nazi Germany 50 years ago. And uh, through your stories, I realized that their precursors could be found even almost uh, a century ago uh, developed by the military with the very same purposes to, 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 to have a convenient spot not observable by the general public, not scrutinizable by, by anyone where they can run their black project. Sure. And this was a military base with an outer fence and an inner fence and they could set military guards there and they did. Now, going into the history of some of the projects which went on there, one has to go back to Nazi Germany in the period of time prior to World War II. And during World War II, they were working feverishly on mind control projects. There were a number of people who were involved with these who were smuggled into the United States in the period from 1933 to about 1942. And I don't think we didn't smuggle them out under the war years because underneath all of the facade of this world war, and we were going to blame, bomb the blazers out of Germany, which we did later. Uh, there was a lot of covert cooperation between the two governments on research. Now, this is hard, perhaps, for some people to accept, but it is a fact which can be proven. Number one item, which has nothing to do with the Montauk project, but which helped to maintain the stability and the functioning of the German military through the major part of World War II, was the fact that when all of the Ploesti oil fields were bombed and blown up and they had no more oil left for gasoline, guess who comes to the rescue? Standard Oil Company of the United States, New Jersey, and gave them the process for converting coal to gasoline. Which so, so, the, so, so, so this is an American process, this is not so a German process. That's correct. It was, always we have always been told it was a German process, which they developed, they did not. It was developed here in the U.S., and that process probably dates back to before the turn of the century, and that's a very long story in itself. In any case, they gave them the process, helped keep the war going, and who knows what other things were done to help keep the German war going, because this war, that is the one in World War II between Germany and the Allies, was not what it appeared to be. It was not a war of politics. It was not a war of borders. It was not a war of people against people. It was a war of banking interests against banking interests who, no matter who won or lost, they all made tons and tons of money because the munitions had to be built to fight the war. Well, actually, this was a war of the bankers against uh, the whole humanity because by killing humanity, they were loading the governmental credit cards with these exorbitant astronomical military expenditures, and also they were achieving their targets of uh, limiting the... Uh, the population on the planet, which has very long been the number one, uh, the number one goal of the Luciferian lobby on the planet to reduce the population. Right, I figured in it, and of course, a periodic war does help reduce the population. Most people throw up their hands in horror at the uh, reported stories of uh, six million Jews dying in the Holocaust in Germany, which is a total fabrication. But nonetheless. Nonetheless, many did die, and there's no question of that. It's the figure is wrong, and who died is wrong, and their, and their causes and the reasons are not accurately reported. Let us say two million 
died in those camps for whatever reason. Does the general public realize that in the bombing raids of Germany, 26 million German civilians died in those bombing raids? The cities were leveled, and when the war was over, Eisenhower himself ordered the German soldiers put into concentration camps and other local holding areas, cut them off, no food and water, and let the tens of thousands of them die. This was the book, the Canadian book, Other Losses, that was seriously debunked even in the tabloid press here, which turned my attention to that. I thought, gee, this must be something very important if they are so angry about the book. Right. <laughs> That's uh, usually the case. This also plays very well with the population uh, policies because bombing Germany gives an excuse to everybody, including the pilots and the bombing crews that would drop the bombs on the uh, cities uh, to eliminate all these people. Uh, yeah. uh, Dresden was target bombed and leveled. Tokyo was carpet bombed. Uh, I'm sorry, carpet bombed. Uh, Tokyo was carpet bombed with incendiary de devices. And in less than a week, actually, I think in two, three nights in Tokyo, there were as many casualties as in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, nuclear bombings. Uh, by, by, by these uh, carpet bombings of whole city neighborhoods. First they would bomb the periphery of the neighborhood uh, to prevent anybody from escaping and then, then they slowly drinking their coffee up there and uh, obstructing <laughs> by, <laughs> right. by any fighter aviation, they would level and burn the whole city. Uh, anyway, uh, to, 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 to come back to the mind control experiments yes. in Germany. Right. As Mealy Mayor wished to make a point here that in spite of the appearances of being terrible mortal enemies, there was covert cooperation going on. And one of the other areas of this covert cooperation was in the fact in the period of 1933 to approximately 42, they were smuggling out Jewish scientists who were working on mind control and other projects. And this was essentially allowed by Germany. Even Einstein was smuggled out. He was smuggled out. He, he did not leave uh, because he was thrown out. This is a total fiction. He left in 1930, before the rise of power of Hitler was his full power, because the National Socialist Party considered him an asset, wanted him to leave, and his, to stay, I'm sorry, and his friends told him, you better get out while you can, because after the war, or let us say the build-up to full power of the Nazis comes into place, you're not going to be able to get out. And he was a pacifist. He knew there was going to be war eventually, so he moved to the U.S. to Caltech, taught there for three years, and was invited to join the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, which he did in 1933, and remained there till his death in 55. But there were many others smuggled out. They did a lot of work on mind control in Nazi Germany during the war, much of it in centering around indoctrination of the SS troops involving supersonic sound impingement on the occipitals of the brain. And uh, it was quite successful. Ultrasonic. Ultrasonic, correct. The Japanese worked on RF techniques, and that has been swept under the rug and was never admitted to by the U.S. government. The stories of the Buck Rogers screws that went into Germany are fairly well known. What is not well known is that some 26 railroad car loads full of patents and other technical data were seized by the British and the Americans and the French when the war was over. And these were technical processes which we did not have and we wanted, and that was one of the aspects of the war. Actually, I heard stories in Renato Vesco's book, Intercept But Don't Shoot, that there were miles of boxcars. There were nine kilometers from one underground huge city. and. 20, uh, excuse me, and, and 16 kilometers from another city, miles of uh, boxcars with, loaded with designs, with blueprints, with machinery, with sophisticated equipment and so yeah. on. You include the equipment and the machinery and working models of devices, yes, it would be a lot more than 26 boxcars for sure. But this whole business of uh, interchange and cooperation took place covertly. The war ended. And, of course, certain of the Nazi hierarchy, namely SS Chief Galen, who was uh, the security chief for Hitler, in a deal worked out by Roosevelt before he died, all of this uh, group of intelligence people was transferred to the United States and formed later the backbone of the CIA. The deal was in order to obtain and retain the surveillance crews and groups which were already in Russia in place. The U.S. agreed to have these people be transferred to the U.S. so we would have the capability, and these people would be left alone.
This is the price. They said, we will do what you want and cooperate with you, but you leave us alone. At the same time, Russia captured another portion of the SS officers, and they had them uh, transfer the SS spies in the United States to the Russian interests. <laughs> so basically, the very same things have been going on on both sides of the curtain, which was a Mickey Mouse curtain to start with. All right, now let us get back to the technical side of this. And the, the Phoenix Project. Right, these people, the scientists from Germany, were held in hiding, so to speak, while the war was on. And when the war was over and 47 rolled around, they went to work for a U.S. national laboratory called Brookhaven National Laboratories at Brookhaven, Long Island. And their first and primary project there for many years was mind control. They worked on this for some 20 years, up until about 1968. Now, since Brookhaven is a national laboratory funded by tax money, they must, under law, report what they're doing in all departments and all projects once a month. Who's on them, what they're doing, what they're accomplishing, what they're not accomplishing, and whether they're going to cancel a project, whatever, the whole nine yards of reporting of what the activities of that laboratory is, or any national laboratory in the U.S. that's receiving tax monies. So this went on for about 20 years. In about 1968, somebody started reading these reports in Congress. Finally. Finally, after 20 years. And they looked at this stuff and they said, mind control? And they're getting results. They might use this stuff on us, cancel a project. The project was canceled, and the orders also came down that these scientists who were working on the project were removed out of Brookhaven, and they were. So they started looking for a new home. And since they were already at Brookhaven, which is more than halfway to the eastern tip of Long Island, it didn't take them too long in looking around to find that Montauk had a military base called Fort Hero. And the Army there was quite interested in what they were doing. They said, why don't you come here and work with us? We'll give you a haven and you can continue your work. So they did. So from Brookhaven, they moved to Long Island Haven. If you want to call it that. A Long Island Haven at Montauk in the underground of Fort Hero. Now, Fort Hero was actually a very large installation, and it was right around a state, a state park, which was built sometime in the period, I think, prior to World War II. How many submarines could dock in these underground pens simultaneously? Uh, from what I understand, only two. It was not an extensive Navy operation. It was basically Army. And it was, of course, a, a uh, defense point during World War I and World War II with the old railroad carriage guns and all of the heavy ammo and such. All of this was abandoned and torn down after World War II. And the radar came in with several systems, and then the Air Force moved in and took over some buildings and did continuing radar work, experimental, and built a SAGE system, and then that was eventually scrapped in 69. Now, it was interesting to note that the people from Brookhaven, the Jewish scientists, and those related to them and working with them, moved out to Montauk about 68, and the base was then formally abandoned by the military in 69. And it became noted on the GAO, General Accounting Office records, that it was an abandoned surplus base. Well, I can assure you these guys didn't move out. It was the ideal cover for them, and they continued to work. Well, I've noticed that what they do is they keep the essential people, and then ro they rotate the non-essential military personnel in, in order to keep the secrecy. They have one group coming and digging the base, another group coming and doing the concrete, a third one does the interior fittings and <laughs> decoration, a fourth one does the initial part of the research, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and that's how through this time-wise compartmentalization uh, the track is lost of go what goes on down there. Right. And of course, they also had built years before, when I don't know, their own electrical power plant. They had four generators of a half a megawatt each in a separate building, and uh, they did for years supply the power, but when they built the later follow-on Phoenix project, they had so much trouble with those generators, they had to stop using them and go to local power, which is Long Island Lighting Company, usually called Lilco, and uh, take power from their lines, but this is much later. Now, the project continued from 69 onward on an abandoned military base, but certain other things also took place in that period which were moved out there also, because this was called the Phoenix Project from about 47 on and became for many, many projects. Umbrella. A real umbrella. Now, what else happened? The 
Philadelphia experiment, which had been scrapped and abandoned in 1943, the Navy revived it and went to John von Neumann in 1947. He was already working at the Institute on producing the first all-electronic digital computer, which he did complete in 1952. Again, but, uh, for the use, the for, use in, for use in many, many areas. But he knew that a computer would be necessary to solve the problems of the personnel and provide a zero-time reference for personnel as well as for the ship. The ship returned after the equipment was destroyed. All equipment was not destroyed, but the, let's say, the banks of electron tubes that provided the power to the fields for the two huge generators provided the magnetic field. When they went, the magnetic fields went, and of course, the regular field slowly collapsed. But uh, the point here is that all of this work was not abandoned. It was put in a file. And the very high-powered electromagnetic fields, which were generated for the invisibility effects, produced the very severe problems on the personnel. And was, this was the result of, of course, grossly excessive magnetic and electronic fields, which never had been used before, to my knowledge or anyone else's, in such close proximity to personnel, namely about 75 feet from the antenna, which was radiating something in the order of 20 megawatt pulses rotating in a circular field uh, of RF, and all of the power that was going into the generators also pulsed to produce a mag rotating magnetic field on the deck. This is very, very high-powered stuff, and you don't subject the human mind or nervous system to this. They found out, of course, later that you don't, and many medical reports were written. In 47, they asked Van Neumann to resurrect the project, see if it could be salvaged, if there was anything they could learn from it. It so would be interesting to see in the medical literature whether these reports can be found. Our leading Russian dissident proved that there was a massive contamination and probably a nuclear explosion in an underground nuclear storage in Ural by discovering an explosion in the number of papers on the radioactive contamination of the environment, mm -hmm. in official papers, in official journals. So if these papers could be traced in official journals, that would be a roundabout way to proving that uh, something like that could have happened. Well, I'm sure that those reports are still classified by the military, the Navy, but I do know one person who examined them and told me that he had examined them, found the, they were very interesting in terms of the results, and that was a Mr. George who were now retired from the Navy, who was in charge of an investigative commission appointed in the Office of Naval Research in 1955. And I've talked with him personally, and he admitted to the Philadelphia experiment, he admitted to the four medical reports, and he said so far as he was concerned, the four medical reports were the most interesting part of it because it was prime research material to try and show what happened to these sailors. What was the cause of the problem? Well, they had to solve it, obviously, and they did. Van Neumann found the means with the computer to provide some type of zero time lock reference to the personnel. How this was accomplished, I do not know, because when the equipment was smashed, the ship returned to its proper point in the harbor because not all equipment was smashed. And the zero time reference generator they had, designed and built by Tesla, and was still working. And even here, a little uh, introduction. Uh, I've noticed that several such smashings occurred in the Philadelphia and Montauk projects uh, when there was a locking into some energies from higher space so that basically the whole system became a free energy device, device that was siphoning energy off from the ether, from the higher dimensions, from the higher classes of energies in the universe. So even after cutting the cables from the local power supplier, the installation would not turn off. Cutting the cables inside it would not turn it all, all of it down. So finally, they had to physically smash the most of the modules in order for yeah. it to shut down, which is another indirect proof that uh, free energy can be obtained out of right. thin air. Uh, in a sense, that is quite true. There is no such thing as a free lunch. The energy comes from somewhere, but our modern physics has not recognized this until very recently that this possibility may exist. Now, to get back to this thing, when they resurrected the project, when Neumann found the answer, we also had built and designed this computer. A new system was delivered to the Navy and tested in 1953, and it was fully successful, no personal side effects, and therefore the Navy now changed the name again from its classification of 1940, 40, which was 
the Project Rainbow, they changed it to the Phoenix Project. It's a continuation of the same project, but again under a new name. The Phoenix Project became an umbrella for many, many things. Now, of course... Can you name a few that are just, that are just oh, yeah. the most important ones? I can. But I want to uh, show the time frame of what happened yes. here to this. So they continued onward after 1953, and of course it went through many generations, and uh, the equipment became small, almost portable, and still worked, and worked very well. How and portable? Uh, down so to the point, case, so down, to a, case? down to the size of essentially of an attaché case, uh, in the latest systems. They do have the capability of making a secret service operator for the president or the government invisible, either with carry-on hardware on his belt or his back or a suitcase, or by treating him in a field which will render him physically invisible without carrying hardware for a period of about 72 hours. Now, this technique is good for that period of time, but when he comes out of it, he gets very sick and very nauseous for days. Uh, the use of the hardware apparently produces no nauseous side effects. In any case, this project continued on, and eventually, while it was initially at uh, Brookhaven, it also was moved to Montauk. And that was what was called P2, or Phase 2, the Invisibility Project. Phase 1 was, of course, the Mind Control, which they developed some very successful techniques in the late 70s. The Philadelphia Experiment hardware and process was continued, and uh, they became very successful with that. It is now installed on all of the supercarriers, all of the fighter aircraft, both Army and Navy, Israeli fighter aircraft, and uh, the B-1 bomber, the B-2, which, of course, is a stealth bomber, and it is very successful. They've made attempts, of course, with the B-2 to make it radar nearly invisible by means of, means of a special absorptive coating. A coating is so damnably heavy that with the normal jet engines, and they have some big ones in it, that aircraft is subsonic. They cannot go supersonic. So they since, according to a rumor, in quotes, outfitted some other special drive engines, uh, ET hardware, if you will, or our own government's developments in those directions, where it makes it a TOV, a transorbital, a transorbital vehicle, which says it can go out into space. Now, according to the public record, only one uh, B-2 has been built because of the unbelievable cost. The research on that thing cost billions upon billions of dollars, I understand, 22 billion total. And they figure to replicate it today will cost about one billion dollars per copy. And the government is tearing their hair out about it. They're thinking they're going to scrap the project. Well, of course, that's what they tell the public. Who knows what they will do? But that's only one of the side aspects. The real main factors of what went on at Montauk were phase three, which was, of course, the development to a much higher degree, time travel, which was discovered by the Germans in 1945. That process was removed after the war was over and went to Montauk. And even prior to that, Dr. John von Neumann had created a time machine. There was no problem in doing this because the technology for the Philadelphia experiment was so similar that it only been me carried a little bit further mm -hmm. with certain controls, and they had a time machine. But there was a separate time machine installation that was yeah. not using the ship's No, coil. it was totally separate. It was fairly small, and von Neumann did this on his own at the Institute under the nose of the Navy without letting the Navy know what he was doing. And, of course, he was not working for the Navy. He was working for the Institute. His time machine hobby, his little hobby. His little hobby. And he just said when it was ready, well, Let's go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Edward, uh, which was my name then, says, uh, let's take a look at what's going on in the future. I want proof that you were back there and that you really talked to me 40 years later. So I made a couple of trips back and forth. I don't honestly recall how many. And uh, eventually I came back with enough paperwork and proof that he was satisfied that, yes, there was a Phoenix Project. Yes, I had been there. Yes, that this thing did exist in the future, and he was part of it going to be, that is, from his viewpoint in 43, 44. How big was this time machine? Do you remember the physical dimensions? Physical dimensions were fairly small. The uh, radiating control element was perhaps six feet high and perhaps uh, two feet, two and a half feet in diameter. Would and you go inside it? Or no, actually it created a field which you just stood within the field. Uh -huh. You didn't have to get in the machine. There was a lot of other peripheral hardware driving it a lot of tube circuits and a lot of other stuff, because in those days everything was electron tubes. In fact, it still is in certain areas, because they're the only things that will work. 
when you're dealing with higher order energies. Did he use a computer to drive it? Or there were no, com no computers then. No computer so the computer did not begin to take shape until 1946. So in the meantime, <clears throat> when he was satisfied, in October of 43, he became part of the atomic bomb project. And of course, he spent a lot of time up there, but not uh, full time. He was there as a consultant. And in early 44, he made a suggestion that to the Navy, well, I'd like to have Edward up there with me. And they loved the idea because it would bury me in the most remote, the most secret base in the United States. And nobody would know where I was. And would, I could not talk about what had happened on the Philadelphia project to the rest of the Navy. And the few people up there had such a high level clearance, uh, if they believed it, they would ignore it anyway. They so, already knew about it. Perhaps so. Because my research has shown that at least two Air Force officers knew all about it at the time it was going on for various reasons. A number of other Navy officers knew about it, some of whom are still alive, whose names I will not use until I have clearance. And uh, there's a lot of evidence around yet which has escaped the notice of the wonderful Navy Office of Naval Intelligence and all the other intelligence agencies that have made a very thorough job at searching stuff out. They've removed all of my school records. They've removed my military records. I'm sure they exist somewhere. Talking about Bob Lazar's story. Of Thank you very much, world. very much. As a friend of mine living in Flagstaff, Arizona, who used to be on the White House staff for President Nixon, told me once when he became interested in my story and maybe trying to uh, set up a system, a possible suit against the government. He says, I can tell you this much from my experience in the White House. He says, I'm not there anymore. I don't want any part of it. But he says, I could make one phone call for 25 cents in a pay phone and say, I want so-and-so's made a non-person. And within week, one week, all records would be gone, from Social Security to bank accounts to school records to employers' records, uh, where he went to school, you name it, driver's license, the whole nine yards, all ID would be gone and he would be a complete non-person. He said that can happen in one week. So basically they have this uh, procedure established because they obviously have used it on numerous occasions. Oh, I'm very dozens and on hundreds of occasions. Definitely they've used it on dozens and hundreds of cases where for some reason they want to keep the victim alive instead of pulling the, uh, as I think as I think L. Ron Hubbard called it, the 2-45 instant theta clearing technique, which means two slugs from a 45. Uh, that's a very quick way of exiting the individual, but it has sometimes its own repercussions, and the military or the government does not wish to do this technique all the time. Undoubtedly, and without question, they've used it many times, but there are cases where they do not want to use it for whatever their reasons. So in any case, uh, I was at Los Alamos by von Neumann's suggestion from 44 to 47, July 44 to July 4, 47. Then I was uh, hustled out on the trumped-up charges, never faced a court-martial because they were trumped-up charges, and the Navy just wanted an excuse for the MPs to arrest me and get me out of there. And then I was given the nine yards of brainwashing. And go when on. you say brainwashing, this means total deletion of your past and, memories, and of your this, identity, and of, of, of everything, everything. Everything. Basically, they delete, they reformat your hard disk, and you lose everything. They lost, uh, lost everything from it. Memory of who I was, all of my history of schooling, everything I had done, that I was Edward Cameron was lost. And then they did the uh, peace de resistance with alien technology help. They did an age regression number, which the government has the hardware for this, but normally does not take anyone to an age earlier than 21 because of the, gen the genetic side effects. And they decided they wanted to uh, reduce me to the age of one and plug me in a new family, the Bielik family. It's a long story, and some people I know may have a great deal of difficulty in believing it, but I was sent back to 1927 as a one-year-old kid, approximately, and plugged in the Bielik family after the kid there, who was the normal, real Al Bielik, and there's a birth certificate to prove it, uh, allegedly died of some illness, and then I was put in as a substitute, and then of course... What was your physical body, not as a walking of your soul into his body? No. They originally intended to do something like that. Uh -huh. But there was, uh, shall we say, I was saved at the last minute by Dr. John Van Neumann, who was totally upset about it and didn't want to see this happen for his own reasons. Mm -hmm. So I went back, and I was a young kid, about one year old, and grew up, and I didn't know anything. 
Uh, other than I was just growing. I relived my entire life in the, from yard one, scratch one. Until you finally discovered your past connections with the Philadelphia experiment. Right. But tell us how, how the Philadelphia led to the Phoenix, I mean, to the time tunnel. How did the idea for the tunnel appear? Who was the... The idea for the tunnels actually was alien, alien technology. We did not have the technology to do this. We had the technology to build a time machine, go either forward or past in time. But we had no technology at that time capable of producing a tunnel where in a person or an object could be sent down this tunnel to another physical location on this planet or another planet or another part of this galaxy and also shift its time reference. This was exceedingly advanced technology, which only the aliens knew how to do. And the Phoenix Project was overrun with aliens. Uh, so basically, uh, what the, uh, the Phoenix technology is ahead of the Philadelphia technology. Much. You don't need the hardware of the Star Trek ship orbiting around the planet to beam you up or down. That's right. Uh, you probably extend the distance of this travel tremendously comp comparable to the teleportation technology. And you can travel in time. That's correct. I don't know whether the teleportation technology can travel in time. That I don't know. But the Phoenix Project with their tunnels as they finally got them to work properly, and it was a long process of a lot of work, all of which is detailed in a new book. Uh, that new book is, of course, The Montauk Project. Fascinating book that we greatly recommend to anyone. It's written by Preston Nichols, and he was part of the Phoenix Project in a major way, as I was, as was my brother Duncan. But he remembered, after a period of time, and his own electronic systems for restoring his own memory, all of the technical details of what he did, what projects were on, and it certainly does not cover all of the projects under the umbrella of the Phoenix Project because none of us remember everything yet, but enough to make a very and viable book. What you remember is fascinating. That's right. I remember walking out of your lecture, the first time I heard your lecture at the Pasadena Whole Life Expo, I had the feeling that the reality, that the world I was living in has ceased to exist for me, that the ground, that somebody pulled the ground from under my feet and that I was free falling into <laughs> unknown space. Yes, we how, did. <laughs> how strongly, how strong was the impact of all this information upon me, despite the fact that for the last 10 years, all I've been doing every day is digging into paranormal, into metaphysical, into the <laughs> ufological and other crazy marginal right. stuff. Well, that stuff, as you call it, is nothing compared to what they did at Montauk and since. But basically, the Montauk project uh, set the pace for everything that came afterwards and did things which I don't think have been replicated. Let's detail a little bit about what they did. They had time tunnels. They were able to go to Mars, as Duncan and I did, to go into the underground of Mars to explore the underground caverns and the, the vestiges the of their civilization. civilization. Right, the vestiges of a dead civilization, which they knew existed, and they had all this evidence on the surface. We've had colonies on Mars since the 60s, late 60s. And, uh, How big are these colonies? Any, any I don't guess? really know. I would have to guess and say there's at least two bubble cities there, and by now they probably don't need the bubbles because they do have an atmosphere on Mars, about 707 millibars, which is seven-tenths that of Earth. And the temperature at the equator is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, which is adequate. So basically and, a pair of jeans and a pullover would right. be good enough for jogging. But when they first went there, they were convinced there was no oxygen, but there was suddenly, for some reason, oxygen released. That's a story I don't really know the whole, all the details over how that happened. But in any case, there are colonies on Mars, and they found monuments, like the famous face on Mars, the pyramids, and they knew there were entrances through them, and they could not break through because these were so huge and so heavy, they did not have Earth-moving machinery of adequate scope to break into these things. So eventually they called back by radio to Earth and says, we got something up here, we know there's an underground here, we can't get into it. Have you guys on Earth got any suggestions? They said, yeah, we'll look into it. And they went to the people running Montauk, which basically was run out of uh, Lincoln Labs, MIT, Massachusetts, by Dr. Herman C. Unterman, who was a project director, manager. 
And they decided that, uh, well, yes, we can undoubtedly get into the underground of Mars, but they radioed back, we need some coordinates of the sections you wish to have explored. And they got those, and they put them in the computer, and uh, what they did the first time was they sent the TV camera through there, operational. TV camera through there, operational, and put it through in the time tunnel, through the time tunnel. tunnel to see whether or not the thing got locked up or came out in a free cavern. Came out in a free cavern. If you're locked up in rock, uh, can you send the camera close to the rock to see the rock wall in front of you? Well, the problem is that the way those time tunnels worked. Or you may fall out of the tunnel. You come out of the tunnel embedded in the rock. and you become embedded in whatever is there, if there's anything there for you to become embedded in. You will not bounce off the wall. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. So in any case, they found it were clear, and then they sent a uh, crew through, Duncan and myself, and there have been other crews since, and a lot of exploration was done in the underground of Mars to find... Who was psychically manipulating and controlling the tunnel when Duncan was up there? Somebody else, probably. No, the, no, there was not another human operator required after the first trip. The reason was that all of the coordinates and all of the basic information, the psychic information, which was used off of Duncan, was recorded on a tape recorder, very exotic one, of course, and all of those coordinates were then restored. And, of course, they could make course corrections for the movement of the planets. There was no problem. Compensation. Total compensation. And what they did when they wanted to go again is they would just push the button for the tape and the whole system, and when they got a green light that everything to go, we went in the tunnel. The tape. Right. Well, the underground caverns. Right. So we went. We made, uh, I believe it was two authorized trips, and we went on our own with two unauthorized trips, because all we had to do was put the reel of tape in the machine and plug the button. <laughs> and when, it's, when it lit up green, we went. And go to Joyride. And take a Joyride to Mars. Well, what did you discover in the underground base? Oh, we and discovered huge amounts of religious artifacts and statuary, large numbers of files, which for some reason Duncan could read. Were and we found paper on they were on some type we were on some type of metallic leaf that looked like paper but it was indestructible and we found other hardware machinery eventually we found their power system was still workable and we just had to find a place to turn it on so we had artificial lighting their own in the underground after this i think the second trip first trip we had to take our own lighting when we found Did you see any sculptures or photographs of these guys to I don't know how they looked. Were they human in size and appearance? They were very human in size and appearance. They were basically the American Indians. That was where the American Indians came from, Mars. But much prior to that, about 300,000 years ago, was an estimate. It's not necessarily an accurate date. So statues, they were taller then, and... Uh, how tall were they? And the statuary ran about eight, seven, eight feet. So the inhabitants at that time were taller than they are now I mean, on Earth because they had a somewhat weaker uh, field exactly, of gravity. Exactly. I've, I've read from many contacty sources that the, gra the intensity of the gravitational field of the planet, basically Billy Meyer through his Pleiadians is the, the main source for me, the intensity of the gravitational field of a planet uh, decides the height of uh, the beings living on that planet and this c height can vary anywhere from the dwarfs of few inches to giants of uh, right. 10, uh, 10, 15 meters which is about 30, right. 40 feet and speaking of that of course we have legends from the past history of earth and the bones have been found and well hidden of course that uh, giants 15, 20 feet high humans, giants and we don't know how they could have lived and survived and of course this question has been asked by many people archaeologists uh, zoologists, whatever, how could these huge dinosaurs have existed with their mass? They didn't have a sufficiently strong bone structure to support their weight and mass, assuming our Earth's gravity was then the same as it is now. So but it was not. It was not. It was about 0.3, a couple hundred, 50 million years ago. So back to the Martian caverns. We took out what we could, then we were discovered that we had made a few unauthorized trips, so we were pulled off of it and other crews were sent. How about the, I remember that you were telling me some time ago about this strange gold that was several times heavier than normal gold. According to Duncan, and that's the only source I have on that, 
there was some 15,000 metric tons of gold which were brought back from the underground to Mars and had a density factor of something like five times Earth gold. Were you able to measure these? I don't know how they measured it. Tons. I don't know well, how they measured them after bringing them back to Earth. I'm sure it was after they brought it back. But that's the story he tells and that he remembers. I have no recollection of that. It might have been that he went on a later trip that I didn't go on and he saw the gold. I did not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No skeletons? No traces of, of war or fighting? No skeletons? Nothing there. There was very clean and, and aseptic, you might say, in okay. the underground. Uh, they took care of the last of their bodies before they died because we estimate that the last of the Martian civilization that moved underground died out perhaps 10 to 20,000 years ago, and that, of course, is a rough estimate. But they died out, and apparently their systems were put on a timer or they had automatic shutoffs, and eventually, well, the power shut off. The other rough estimate. But they died out, and apparently their systems were put on a timer or they had automatic shutoffs, and eventually, well, the power shut off. The only thing that kept going, and this is a very strange item, is the radio transmitter in the face on Mars. Uh, NASA has commented on this, so they're receiving a weak signal. So is that true? Yeah. That transmitter, though very weak, is still transmitting, and NASA could pick it up. But that was the end of our Mars escapades. And uh, we came back, and uh, Duncan and I were split from working together because there were other people had other projects in mind for him and myself. And one of the other projects we were working on there, of course, two of them I will go into it because one is going into in the book and the other is not was of course the indoctrination of these young kids almost all blonde haired blue eyed all males some 10,000 amount to talk in the age bracket between 12 and 17 typically around puberty and were some they of them cloned? no they were they, they were run through cured? Uh, some of them, the later ones, were cured as street kids through the time tunnels from other parts of the U.S. because they wouldn't be missed being street kids. Initially, they were... With time tunnels? Yeah. Or, or yeah. With, 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 with a saucer craft hovering above and uh, teleporting and beaming them up? No, I believe it was all with the time tunnels. The earlier phases of this, they actually went around with trucks on Long Island physically and picked up kids and kidnapped them. And, of course, there was a hell of a furor over some of the kids disappearing on the island from the families. And what they were doing was they were putting through an initial processing to see if they were suitable for the project. And when they got to a certain point and they realized that they were acceptable, they were given... A, and when they got to a certain point and they realized that they were acceptable, they were given a very heavy Reikian programming. And the Reikian programming in the earlier stages was purely physical, psychosexual. And for the sake of the sensitive uh, hearts that may be in the audience, I will not detail it exactly, except it was a fully homosexual procedure. And later on, because of the fact... That was using the pure orgasmic state. Exactly, the pure orgasmic state to transfer the program from the uh, programmer to the programmee, which was the kid. No hardware. No hardware in the early phases. Too many kids died from this procedure, and I, among others, screamed bloody murder and said, you've got to change this procedure, and it was eventually changed to an all-electronic procedure. What did they do with these uh, surplus kids? The surplus kids that didn't make it? They threw them in the vault and on the underground, and at the time when we left, there was about 400 bodies buried in that vault. A huge steel vault with a very large lock, so nobody could get in there without the right combo. Uh, by the way, Preston Nichols, in his book, The Montauk Project, Again, the book here, he's talking about uh, the skeletons that were cleared uh, right before the base was abandoned and the entrances were concreted with uh, concrete. That may well be. I have no what did, idea. What, what, what were these kids intended for? That's what for we're still... Future? That's what we're still trying to find How out. Did they end up? Did they send them, shoot them in the future for some missions for the... We believe, we believe most of them were sent into the future. And there are some clues to indicate that many of them wound up in the time frame of 1995-96. And they had an implanted program, which in essence said, you go about your normal life wherever you are, and when we want you to do whatever you want, uh, we want you to do, a radio signal, actually not pure electromagnetic, but second order scalar type signal. Which would be a telepathic signal. Right, exactly. It hits detectable, but by any of the conventional hardware. That right. And these individuals would pick up the signal, and if it, they were tuned to the coding in the signal, 
they would hear a message, and Preston proved this with hardware, which he's resurrected and tried it himself. They would get this message. If you hear this message, call such and such phone number. Telepathic message right in their head. Without exactly. Hardware without little bug into their brain. Right. Directly into their transpa uh, to telepathic uh, and, the, and the range of this transmitter is enormous. Preston rebuilt one based on the data he had and the information and put a message on a little tape recorder and fed it into the modulator. A 250-watt transmitter, which is not very high-powered, put it out in Long Island in a friend's large yard and uh, put it on run for about, I think, 72 hours. Maybe not continuously, but over three days. And the message was, if you hear this message, call such a... Well, Preston did not himself receive these calls. He set it up with a friend who had the phone number and there was a tape recorder on that mm -hmm. phone. They received over 600 phone calls from the entire East Coast, from Boston down to Florida, on the basis of a small transmitter. So with that... And Preston proved that this sort of a system could be done. So you go call the number, and you probably get the rest of your instructions, or maybe you get told to go to such and such place for the final indoctrination. Yeah. Who knows what? But this is well, the way they did it. Get the final triggering that right. will trigger the whole program. Exactly. A very interesting uh, parallel here with the abduction victims that are implanted in this country. Uh, my firm belief is that these victims are abducted by the government, by our own uh, patriotic American government, uh, implanted, and depending on the different stories and rumors, between 1 in 40 to 1 in 10 of the American population have been implanted. Right. Uh, this may be another and more primitive system that requires a physical implant, a physical microchip in your head, uh, in order for them to communicate with you, but many, I see here parallel uh, stories. Uh, many of the implantees have been told, have been prepared with some programming that is hidden very deep under many blocks, under many subconscious blocks that cannot be accessed by the... Uh, by any normal means. By any normal psychoanalysis. That's what they tell us. Maybe may, maybe right. they do, but they don't tell. But anyway, th th there's an interesting parallel. These people are prepared for some eventual end times or some eventual grand finale of this uh -huh. uh, 20th century scenario. Could well be. Uh, we were some 10,000 kids were processed through Montauk. We know this from the memories and some indication of a few of the records which have survived. And, and that's only one of those one of 25. 25. And we extrapolate that they probably treated some twenty, uh, some 10,000 on each one of the other 24 bases. So you have the possibility here of a quarter of a million kids in or around puberty being so treated and brainwashed and given these instructions in their head and sent off, maybe to their own time where they come from, and maybe into the future. No way to know because those records are still sealed somewhere. A uh, quarter of a million kids as a number may sound too large and shocking, but anyone who is willing to spend five minutes calling the milk carton uh, 1-800 number for the missing milk carton kids would get an estimate, a rough estimate. Uh, the first call I did uh, to this number, I was told by a lady that she said, well, we never had them totaled, we never <laughs> had them calculated. Well, give me an, an, an educated guess. This is the first time I call you. I've probably worked on the project for five or ten years. Yeah, five years. So what's your guess? Well, she said 200 to 300,000 a year. I thought that she would say 20 to 30,000 a year. A year. So, a year. so uh, over several years of, of period, uh, there won't be any problem at all to, 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 to come with these uh, 250,000 surplus kids that would be sent wherever needed, right. wherever required by the party. And we do know that a few of the kids were pulled out for special projects, and there was an attempt made on certain ones to develop extremely high-level psi abilities. Uh, one part of that project that I was in charge of was canceled. The boys from Brazil scenario or something, something like, like that. that. right. And another part of the project which was ongoing was, of course, uh, the one of attempting, as they've attempted for a long time, to create a crossbreed between humans and reptilians. And there was, a, there was a formal name for this project, it was called Project God's Edge. God's Edge? Edge, E-D-G-E.
God as it normally spelt. I won't use the name of the man who is in charge of this project because he is still working for the government and uh, he is a friend of mine and I don't wish to cause him extreme embarrassment or trouble. On the cutting edge of godly genetics. Yes. Out during the creator, out of the uh, motto of the Luciferian hierarchy on the planet. Right, and the aliens, that is the Orion group, the Draconians, the Liberons who had the technology plus the Syrians, Orion group, the Draconians, the Liberons who had the technology plus the Syrians who now and ever heavily all had this technology and knew how to implement it. They knew that we were sufficiently advanced to build whatever they gave us instructions to build, which is what we did. Now what they ultimately intended for this hardware, this project, is hard to know because after Duncan the and I... hybrid project. Well, that goes on elsewhere. But in any case, after Duncan and I arrived from the Eldridge and returned to the Eldridge, then the word went out because there had been a plot afoot for weeks, if not a month, because suddenly Duncan, as the current Duncan, on the base had decided, and a few other people, that it was time to wreck this project. It was totally out of hand, and they didn't know really where it was going and so forth, so they cooked up a little plot. And that plot was that a special monster of the id would be implanted in Duncan's mind and at the proper signal, which was after we had left to return to the Eldridge, and we knew that the Eldridge was probably back in the harbor. Monster of the id would be monster of his subconsciousness. That's right, and he would sit in the chair, and they would say, the time is now. The thing came out of his subconscious through the computer system, went into the transmitter, and was given 3D clothing, if you will, a solid 3D object. Flesh. 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 Muscles. Bones. Everything. By the computer. Uh, it's a fascinating story. I was very uh, skeptical at the beginning, but if we remember the book published by Wendell Stevens again, uh, his brilliant uh, line of books, contractee books, this particular book is uh, UFO from Venus I Came, the recollections of Omnic Onic, uh, there in their uh, higher dimensional etheric culture, everyone can materialize objects, food, furniture, clothing, everything they need out of the ether. So okay. basically there is nothing special in the materialization of, of matter out of the ether through no. the powers of the mind. Not at all. Here, a little bit of a hardwarian uh, crutch was used because obviously our brains are not that good and powerful not, enough not to do it developed. entirely no. on their own. No, the image was created and processed by Duncan and the machine took the rest of it and gave it a solid 3D clothing and this of course goes back a few years to some of the early experiments on Montauk wherein they actually had done before the time tunnel project actually came into being were doing some experimental work in which they attempted whether it was Duncan or it was one of the other psychics would sit in a chair visualize something in their mind Mm -hmm. And on the base somewhere, is this visualized object would materialize solid 3D. Not a holographic projection, but solid 3D. You could go up and hit it and whack it like a table or a chair. And sometimes then you shut the transmitter off, it disappeared, and other times it remained there. I bet the, the, the base was full of, of surplus pin-up semi-nude <laughs> models that these guys were fond of visualizing. Well, there's a lot of possibilities there. But <laughs> Whatever they visualized, uh, I'm sure they didn't continue this phase too long because it would obviously get out of hand. But nevertheless, they proved a point and that they could do this. And this was the first time that we know of in history where a machine could be used to create physical matter out of a person's mind. Out of a person's mind. And that was a real major milestone. From that, of course, later came the time tunnels. To step back, just a little side question that actually uh, uh, is related to one of my speculations and dreams. Uh, I thought of, would it be possible to make a copy machine, a copier, a Xerox machine that would be able to copy one physical object into another? You put a, a, a gold bar or a VCR in the uh, original chamber and you push the copy button and in the copy chamber you have uh, the total perfect material image, working image of the original copy. Do you think that with this technology uh, such a thing may be possible? Because uh, if you can 
materialize a body using the 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 the, 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 the fuzzy blueprints in someone's head I think it would be far easier to make a copy of a VCR using the concrete dimensions of an original other model. I think of all of the people who would put out of work. Exactly. <laughs> and of course, if it were gold bars or silver coins and they were replicated in this way, it would be a, a, a total, total debauking of our currency and of our economy. Now, I don't think it was ever carried to that point. To my knowledge, they never use it for a duplication. It was done as a point to prove that you couldn't physically create something out of the human mind. Fascinating. I remember uh, another interesting story that came to me through Hal Wilcox, uh, a very interesting contractor that I've been associated with for a very long time here in Los Angeles. Uh, in his visit to a planet nearby, in a, uh, it's about five light years away from our sun, uh, the planet Celo, around a barna star i'll hope that i would be correct here about the star anyway on that planet uh how observed an assembly line for producing a flying saucer <laughs> which was a, a very curious uh um vision i mean a very curious show happened in front of him uh it was an assembly line of something like cookie shapes that were in the form of seashells of oysters i mean the 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 the, the <laughs> the shell oyster and they would open and then something like a dump truck or something would empty trash metal scrap basically a, a dump truck would empty the trash inside the shell the shell would be closed then some vibrations and some strange noises would come out of it and when the shell is open again there would be a gleaming perfect uh, flying saucer inside the shell this may be another advance uh, of chemical technology of basically retransforming the elements and yeah. the elementary particles constituting them from the trash into the necessary uh, metal shapes and uh, profiles and, and the whole working mechanism of a flying saucer. So basically these things are probably possible somewhere yeah. in the universe. Well, it reminds me of a movie done by Spielberg some years ago entitled Batteries Not Included where they had miniature UFOs flying around and one or two of them got damaged, so they went to the junk heap of somebody's garbage up on the uh, top floor, and the, actually the roof of an apartment house, and pulled all kinds of pieces of junk out and pounded them together and repaired in their ship. And of course, it was a little miniature thing, perhaps uh, uh, 12 inches in diameter, but it was a curious idea, a nice touch that <laughs> Spielberg put in there. So back to the Phoenix Project and the materialization of... Uh, material objects out of uh, someone's mind uh, well would you tell us what happened later how how did these things actually we were approaching that uh, story of the monster when, when, yes. when the monster got out of the well basically what happened was in the final phase when the group who decided to sabotage the station uh, knew that it was clear and it had to be done at that point they gave the instruction to Duncan, the time is now, so the thing in his subconscious went into the transmitter and it created this huge monster. It looked like a Sasquatch. And it was reported as being anywhere from 12 to 30 feet high, depending, I'm sure, on how terrified the observer was when he saw it and how fast he could run. But this thing went around in late afternoon, apparently, on the base, smashing buildings, tried to get in the main radar tower, which is reinforced concrete and steel and very strong, could not get into it. The monster was probably trying to beam itself up and away from our planet. <laughs> no, apparently it wasn't intelligent enough to do that. But it was just apparently programmed to kill and to destroy. And it did kill a number of people on the base who were walking around and picked them up and against the wall, and that was it. Squish. This thing was unbelievably strong. And if we assume uh, 12 to 15 foot height, which I think is somewhat within reason, it could undoubtedly do this readily. But uh, this thing kept running around amok. The station master, who was then Jack Pruitt, and the co-station master, who was uh, Preston Nichols, knew what was happening and decided they had to end this thing. They went for the main power switches, local, providing in those days the power. Tried to uh, remove the power by pulling the switches off, and they were frozen, just like on the Eldridge. So they then decided to get some uh, 
cutters and went and cut the main power cable frozen, just like on the Eldridge. So they then decided to get some uh, cutters and went and cut the main power cables coming out of the transformer network, the transformer mini station they had there, and cut those, and nothing happened. Then they went the other side so of the transformers. This, this means that uh, basically some free energy device yeah. was yes. already running and siphoning energy off <clears throat> from the ether, from the same ether. So they then went around and cut the cables on the other side of the transformers, and still nothing happened. And then I understand, according to the uh, dialogue in the book, Preston says, uh, well, let's go digging and see if there are some hidden cables. And they did find some. And they cut those, and then the lights in the station went out. But the transmitter kept running, and the computers kept running, and everything was running like nothing was wrong. So at that point, either uh, Pruitt or Preston, or both, decided, everybody get out of here. We're going to have to go in the station and cut this thing apart with a acetylene torch. So they did. They cut all of the main feed cables between the uh, computers, the modulators, the modulators to the drivers for the finals, and when they cut enough cables and enough drive sections, then the whole thing went down and it stopped feeding itself power out of the Dirac Sea. And within a few hours, the e monster disappeared from view, went back to essentially the realm it had come from. The Dirac Sea would be the vacuum sea, the energetic yeah. sea? Zero point energy out of the zero point vacuum, hmm. in essence. You have to consider that this computer, the whole complex of many computers, had all of the information from uh, the leading edge of technology programmed into it, information about gravity, about everything else, and it was relatively simple for a computer like that to figure out how to extract free power from someplace because it was already dealing with hyperspace energy. So you're implying that that was probably one of the first comp computer rebellions in the long list uh, computer rebellions in the secret military black, black projects that I suspect that one of these was probably the famous how misbehavior in uh, the fiction movie right 2010 right or was, what was it 2001 2001 was yeah. where hell uh, rebelled so you, you think that mm. the computer becomes self-conscious yes N no less than a person than Albert Einstein himself said many years ago when he was alive, that he says, if you make a machine of sufficient complexity mm -hmm. and feed it enough power, it will in time become of itself intelligent. He knew this, and Fascinating. it was proven by Montauk. So they had to chop it apart, and it went down, the whole station crashed, and it was never revived, and eventually all of the surviving participants were given their debriefing after January 1, 1984, and were scattered in various directions. And that was the end of the Phoenix Project. Now, certain other aspects of the Phoenix Project were carrying on elsewhere. As we found out, there was one going on in West Germany. Mm -hmm. A man surfaced who was the financial director of the Phoenix Project and interfaced with the financial interests of the CIA because he was already, if you want to put an expression, hooked by the CIA. Mm -hmm. And he surfaced about six months ago, and we were debriefing him in a way which exposed his hidden memories. And he started to remember Montauk and who was there, what was there, what happened, what programs were involved, what he was involved in, names, places, dates, things which, of course, caused, I'm sure, a sheer panic to the government because he was monitored 24 hours a day by the CIA and other intelligence groups. And he was on a two-year suspension from final sentencing for uh, self-admitting that he had misappropriated some $300,000 of money not from the a company accounts, which is where it came from, because they proved conclusively he never signed the signatures on those checks. There was collusion with the company. Mm -hmm. But they did find, of course, that he transferred money from his account where it mysteriously appeared into other accounts that made him culpable, because he then took that money, did not report it, used it for his own purposes, and that made him a... a, a but he was <coughs> instrumental in transferring the money to Germany. Yes, he was instrumental in... Any other countries that made... Don't know. Some Don't know. Process? No, they continued, Japan, they continued part of the Phoenix Project on in uh, western Germany, probably in the Black Forest. And that was Project Marla, if I remember correctly. Marla. Marla, M-A-R-L-A. Hmm. And he knew of other projects, but at that point they suddenly decided he had to be sentenced, and he refused to fight it and asked change of his plea from guilty to not guilty and demand a jury trial. He wouldn't do it. He refused to appear on the Geraldo Now It Can Be Told show. Geraldo wanted him on the show mm -hmm. and wanted to expose this whole business, and he finally said no. 
He was probably concerned about his family and I'm sure had been threatened because he has a wife and three kids. Mm -hmm. And of course this makes somebody very vulnerable. And if he feels he has a feeling for his family, he's going to shut up and do what he's told. So they put him in a country club prison in uh, West Virginia or Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And he's there and uh, he will eventually get out. It was a 33 month sentence and probably get out early for good behavior. Any other spin-offs from the Phoenix Project, per se? Uh, not that I can at this moment think of. I'm sure there are others, I and we're still researching it to find out what else went on. Uh, uh, well, I remember we talked several months ago, and you mentioned that uh, certain uh, strong vibrations of the etheric kind that certain extremely sensitive psychic people have sense here in Los Angeles and Phoenix uh, may have come from the next generation of a Phoenix project that was trying to open portal, a, new hole. a, a wormhole uh, yeah. into not this universe but into the adjacent, into the neighboring universe. Right. Uh, do you, can you elaborate anything on that? Partially. Uh, through various friends and contacts I have, having been an engineer for 30 years, you do make a few friends. And I did find out that there was a time research program going on run by our U.S. government, and that the headquarters for this was at Los Alamos, New Mexico, and they were having some serious problems with it. I got this from other engineers. They had real problems. They finally had to shut it down. And whether it's been revived since or not, I don't know, but it kicked up all over the country. Because when you're dealing with basically time waves, you were dealing with a force and a phenomena which knows no limit in terms of distance that that phenomena will travel. A time wave can be generated or a time modulating system for a, a modulating the time wave can be generated by a very small piece of equipment involving two transistors or two tubes and the right coil and associated pieces of equipment, even portably. And that thing can be turned on on the East Coast, on Long Island. And this has been done. I have felt it in Phoenix. Hmm. And the transmission is not instantaneous. The time wave is not an instantaneous transmission, but it is fast. Uh, my, my, my personal uh, experience with the metaphysical literature also tells me that the higher the class of energy that you learn to manipulate, the easier it becomes to manipulate the lower levels, the right. hierarchically lower levels of matter and energy, and the more compact the whole hardware, the whole device becomes right. to the point of having it as small on your uh, a oh. ring on your finger, or even basically finally you learn to do that with the powers of your brain. Yes. But other other uh, spin-offs of, of the Phoenix project? No can't think of any more right now, but the one about the time is Were they interesting. Were successful to open a wormhole to the uh, yes. neighboring universe? Yes, this was an attempt to break through to a neighboring universe, and my information is they were successful and caused a huge backlash that the neighboring universe put a plug in their tunnel, if you will, and eventually it was moving its plug all the way back to the end at Los Alamos. Uh, right. This sounds a little bit comical, like these uh, like comics, the children's comics. Is that <laughs> we don't want you poking around in our in our little sand pile, so we're putting a plug in your game. So it's essentially when their plug landed into our soup. Uh, there was, I don't believe there was anything like a major explosion, but they had a lot of equipment failures, uh -huh. and they had to shut down. Whether or not it's ever been fired back up or not, I don't know. I have two sources at the present time which tell me of those operations and the problems they had with them, and a second source which indicates, yes, they know of the time experiments. So I would not detail what. Huh, fascinating. So maybe this will be the, 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 the topic of our next interview, travels beyond our universe in, in, uh, to the universes is around us. But so, so this means that the Phoenix technology is capable of all universe travel, to travel to, uh, of, uh, travel to every point in our universe. Definitely, every point in our universe, and they actually did break through to another universe. Little or no time, basically in, uh, uh, as measured uh, by an uh, external observer here on our planet, 
and, and by another moving and transported observer that goes through the time. So basically, the time is very short, like seconds or minutes. Yep. Typically, it would run about one minute, 30 seconds to a minute. If you were traveling to another point on this planet, it would be probably less than 30 seconds. If you were traveling to Mars or some other more remote point, it could take many minutes. Uh, but still, it was very fast. But less than an hour. Oh, yes, yes. They didn't want to keep the tunnels open that long unless it was absolutely essential because they were always concerned about equipment breakdowns. Oh, I see. So what they would do normally was they would... The tunnel would be up, up, up and, and program... The human being travels, then they, they bring them down, and then they would reopen them again to bring the human being right. back. It would be prearranged and pre-programmed. Uh, were they able to send material and hardware and stuff through the tunnel? Oh, yes. Bricks, yeah. cement... To start building well, some if, bases if, elsewhere? If they could send gold bricks through space-time, I think they could send anything else. And they did lose some of the stored gold from the underground by admission of Herman Sienterman himself in the early days when the tunnels were not stable. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, I heard the stories that another Phoenix uh, station was built on another planet as a backup station in case everything fails on this planet. Uh, 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 then the hierarchy here would still have a an escape uh, chute or route, so to speak. It was not necessarily on another planet. My recollection of it is it was actually in another universe. And it was very well concealed. It was done in case everything failed here. They would find a way to get to that one and continue the research there. That one was located and apparently was put out of commission by friendly aliens, who put it that way. So basically that other uh, unit, that other base is not operational right now. No. Uh, you have traveled through these time tunnels. I mean, can you describe for us what's the feeling, what's the sensation? It's like traveling in a subway or traveling in a, in a kiddie slide in, 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 at, at Disneyland? What do you feel when... Just describe, I mean, you are in a room, then you see a portal, a door, you open the door, you walk into the tunnel, you, you, That's right. you, you jog through the tunnel. No, you walk into the tunnel at the entrance, and then you are propelled by the energies of that tunnel, standing upright, essentially, down through the tunnel to the other end. You don't touch the walls. What you, would happen if you poke your finger through the wall? You would lose a finger? No, basically nothing, because they seemed to be quite hard-wise, energy-wise, they were quite hard. Uh, you might get a slight shock, as I remember, because we, yeah, we tried that sort of thing in a number of things, and uh, no, it didn't cause us to disintegrate or create other problems, what? great or create other problems. But how, how, how will your feet touch the tunnel? Or they were not you didn't. touching you. They were flying in. You, you were floating in a, I won't say a bubble. You were floating in essentially the center of this tunnel, uh -huh. which was about eight feet diameter. Eight feet down. <laughs> and then you would flow down that thing, and uh, when you got to the other end, you would land on dry ground, assuming you were scheduled to land on dry ground. Al, oh, did you take your graffiti can with you? Did you spray pants up, paint up, <laughs> signs? Al was here. No, but I think it would have been interesting if I had. Or take a camera. We were not allowed to take cameras, except, I think, once, and that was into the Mars Why operation. Was because of, of security reasons? Partly security and partly in many of these operations, they do not want to disturb the balance of uh, time. I won't say the balance of nature, but the balance of time. And to take a picture of something at the other end and bring it back here uh -huh. creates an anomaly. Uh -huh, you, can, uh -huh. you can go see it. Uh, you can move an object. But if you bring an object back here, you better be careful about what it is you're bringing back and what the consequences are over there. Preston Nichols, is, in his book, is talking about such an artifact being a witness, a metaphysical uh, witness, a piece of an object that is used as target matter to target uh, witchcraft uh, curse uh, against you, a piece of your hair in the hands of a mm -hmm. magician, or a piece of a photograph that would help him a direct the her curse toward you or some of these uh, fancy hardware or human beings as you and your brother have been uh, 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 walking uh, uh, relay line plugs as... Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, a witness can be used and it can be used in less exotic hardware than the Montauk operation. Any uh, basic psychotronics hardware uses a witness of some type, whether it be a biological witness or a photograph in order that 
that individual's energies can be focused or transmitted to another end, or somebody can use it mm -hmm. if they want to on the dark side. They can use it to hit you with some very negative energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they have to have a witness of some kind to the person they wish to hit. You know, Whether it be beneficial, right target, right. Yeah, target places, exactly. sort of target location, target time, and so on. Whether it be a beneficial uh, thing or whether it be uh, a very negative hit trying to put the person out of commission. Anything else interesting about the tunnel? The, how, how you would get out of it? How you would find it on the other end? I mean, being on the, um, the underground? You would be given very careful coordinates and markings. When you got there, you marked the spot, and uh, the tunnel would disappear. With spray paint again? spray paint, chalk, crayons, uh -huh. whatever. And uh, at the appropriate time that you knew in advance, the tunnel would reappear in the same spot. Uh -huh. And you would just re-enter the tunnel, and instead of it flowing that way, they reversed the phase, so it pulled you back to the oh, station. I see. Oh, I see. Were there people lost because they couldn't find their tunnel back? I remember that there were a few lost. There wasn't many. Uh, and there were also one or two cases where the tunnel broke with somebody. Oh. Electronic failure, if you will. And everything was lost. Yeah, and the, and their atoms were scattered. Appendages of that tunnel? Any? Good point. There were. The tunnel, in theory, ran straight through to the target area. But it was known, and nobody knew the answers to this, they created occasionally side tunnels in which the orders were very strict. Under no circumstances do you ever go down the side tunnels. Were there any luring objects? No, but there were uh, the step. There were noises. There were indications that somebody was down. Some of them, and of course, this is what got Duncan in trouble. He uh, decided to go down one of those side tunnels. What did he find there? Aliens. And I had to go rescue him. He aliens or she aliens? James, if I know now. <laughs> Uh, anyway, we had to go back and get something they wanted and return it to them, and then they let him loose, and they weren't going to let me loose either. And I said, now, wait a minute. If there's anything you want, one of us has to go back and get it. And they said, yes, there is something we want. And I said, well, why don't you send me, and so forth. They agreed on that. And I said, you got Duncan as a hostage. We'll be back. Tell us what it is you want. And they told us, and we got it and brought it back, and then they released both of us. Mm -hmm. So, oh, this was that. Uh, this was the Nichols tells in his book that crystal charging device. Right. In it their was. ship that got sucked right. into the underground of the moon. Essentially, that's what it was. Hmm. They wanted it. Uh, so basically, uh, to wrap this whole story up, uh, I've been, I've never been, <laughs> I've never ceased to be, I never ceased to be fascinated, to be amazed at the. Um, I mean, never-ending cornucopia of, 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 of secret projects, of this fountain of, of, of secret technologies that keeps coming from the underground bases. What Al has been telling us here for several years is the story or some of the stories that he witnessed in one of these uh, uh, many, many dozens, if not hundreds of underground bases. Uh, we're talking uh, for a period of 50 years ago in time. Uh, there were 25 Phoenix technology locations based on the number of amplitron tubes, 100 tubes that they built for per site. Uh, but there were dozens, if not hundreds, of other uh, locations doing mind control experiments, doing genetic uh, crossbreeding, hybrids, and, and, and other experiments, uh, doing God knows what. Uh, so my feeling is that in God knows what. Uh, so my feeling is that the ruling elite, the Illuminati elite of the planet, would always uh, like to have a technological lead of between 20, 50, but usually between 50 and 100 years ahead of uh, the mass circulated technologies, the secret technologies, the secret knowledge, the hermetic knowledge, is usually a century ahead of the uh, mass circulated, of the mass usage, knowledge and technology. Uh, these stories that the British landed on the moon at the end of the 19th century, in the 1890s, that I've been researching personally myself, 
I'm more and more becoming convinced that they are physically, physically and engineeringly possible and feasible. Uh, and, 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 and many other such countless stories, stories about uh, occult, metaphysical, and alchemical schools that the children of the elite get their head start in uh, visiting. These are schools where probably kids are taught in a one-to-one, face-to-face -one, uh, -face, uh, environment with a teacher. Nothing to do with the public school system of, of uh, debilitating the American children. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, I'm coming from a country, from Bulgaria. Little Bulgaria fights with Romania for the place next to the last place in Europe, for the place ahead of Albania as the poorest country in Europe. However, fortunately enough, we, well, we were fortunate to have the German education system. It was copied and moved lock, stock and barrel, as they say. Uh, and, I mean, my feeling comparing our education system in Bulgaria, math, literature, and, and, and languages, and everything, with the American uh, public school system is that uh, I mean, this is a third world country's education system, which was done on purpose to this country to keep the large masses of the population ignorant exactly of these secret projects that are going on uh, beneath the surface, literally, and in a, how should I say, in a, in a non-literal sense. But uh, let's try to summarize my feeling here on these secret technologies is that uh, not only that there is a, techno a lead of, of 100 years uh, between the secret and the mass technologies, but the question is who is behind all, this, all these things? Uh, Obviously, uh, the depth of this conspiracy is, is way more massive than 99% than, than, than of the conspiracy theorists are willing to uh, admit or to tackle. Uh, numerous books have been published that the government started uh, examining the aliens from the 1989. Howard Bloom published a book called Out There. Uh, to me, this is a close encounter of the sleazy kind <laughs> publication. Uh, many would move this uh, much earlier. In the 60s, in the 50s, uh, some diplomatic relations were established with aliens. My feeling is that aliens have been contacted, contacting our elite, our uh, scientific, our political elite, all throughout the century, throughout the centuries, and a small handful of people had known about the existence of alien civilizations, had known about the existence of, of, of quite advanced alien no, no, knowledge, uh, centuries ahead of uh, the knowledge uh, their own society was using. So, uh, I mean, this cooperation has been going on for, for many centuries. If we turn to the uh, contactee sources, to Billy Meyer, for example, the Pleiadians landed on our planet 180,000 years ago. So for hundreds of thousands of years, these contacts have been going on. And uh, to, to move the, uh, the conspiracy even further, my feeling is that these are not uh, uncoordinated, chaotic, unbrokered, un <laughs> uh, <co> <laughs> Uh, how should I say, choreographed contacts. On the contrary, there is a, the invisible hand, the mastermind hand, that is uh, uh, coordinating all these uh, activities on the planet. And uh, in my opinion, the, the, this invisible hand is the, uh, the celestial, uh, these are the celestial management systems management hierarchies that elbow each other, that arm twist each other for control of the planet. Uh, in my long study, because my research on uh, anti-gravity and uh, German uh, flying saucers during the Second World War, and they are landing on the Moon and Mars, this is uh, the, 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 the smallest part of my research. Basically, the biggest part of my research goes into, consp uh, into comparative contactology and comparative revelatology. And here I would like to share with you a book, a uh, fascinating book, 
that I found in the metaphysical books or in the body tree. It's called the Urantia book, U-R-A-N-T-I-A, -A, Urantia book. It's published by the Urantia Foundation in Chicago, Illinois, a reference in the Library of Congress, stolen from most of the main libraries, including the UCLA Library, where it was donated. Uh, it's a massive volume. Actually, this inside is not the book. This is the concordex to the book. I forgot my book to, uh, at the study group place where I go from time to time. But, uh, and this is not the most important book. I mean, there are many other. This is not the only important book. There are many other important books about other hierarchies that uh, fight for influence on our planet. But this is the universe according to the Trinitarian hierarchy. And uh, in this book, there is a fascinating chapter on, actually three chapters, uh, three papers of about uh, 20 pages on the Lucifer Rebellion that happened 250,000 Earth years ago. Uh, a rebellion that involved about a third of the celestial Trinitarian management hierarchy of our local universe, angels that uh, sided with Lucifer, and uh, a third of, uh, of the terrestrial management beings. Anyway, my feeling is that uh, if one wants to go into the higher levels of, 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 of celestial conspiratology, we all remember the pyramid on the dollar bill, that the lower two-thirds of the pyramid are made of stones, of bricks, of tangible material matter, but the upper one-third with the all-seeing eye in it is semi-transparent. It's made of uh, almost invisible, etherical, uh, super-material matter. This is a good metaphor to me of the hierarchical cons conspir <laughs> conspirative uh, arrangement of the universe. Uh, pyramid, pyramidal arrangement of the universe where the lower levels of hierarchies are always controlled by the uh, upper levels of stones, by the upper levels of hierarchies, and so on, until the very top. And there are several such uh, management hierarchical pyramids. One is the Trinitarian pyramid, as depicted in the Urantia book. Another one is the um, uh, Jehovian pyramid, as depicted in the Waspi book. Unfortunately, I don't have it here with me handy, but we'll show it sometime in, in the subsequent lectures. Anyway, and discussions. Uh, my feeling is that not, n nothing of these secret projects happened coincidentally, happened through chance and chaotic uh, uh, diplomatic treaties and, and, and relations with extraterrestrial races. My feeling is that these contacts have been brokered, have been coordinated and orchestrated by the Luciferian hierarchy because, unfortunately, 90% of the uh, extraterrestrial contacts with our planet are with races that philosophically stand on the position that is taken by Lucifer in his Lucifer Manifesto, as depicted in the Urantia book. I wouldn't like to go into the... Uh, philosophical side of this discussion. This is a... I wouldn't like to go into the uh, philosophical side of this discussion. This is a question of an entirely different matter of entirely different discussion. But uh, the point that I want to make extremely strongly is that all these contacts are made, uh, are, are basically planned and carried out by the uh, Luciferian hierarchy that is around our planet. And even uh, these teleportational and time tunnel, uh, time portal transportational technologies that have been uh, feverishly developed in so many sites around our planet, uh, I recently had a strange hunch thinking about the Phoenix project. Uh, Phoenix is a metaphor for something that dies and is reborn again out of the ashes. I was curious whether the Phoenix project was not uh, uh, an installment policy of the <laughs> Luciferian hierarchy, uh, being afraid of the approaching end times and preparing itself a nice and cozy escape route 
because actually through these time channels, and I would like uh, to get our opinion, our opinion on that, but you, you can have not only bricks and cement and hardware and material and human beings, but probably you can have angelic beings and higher order beings. And I wouldn't be amazed that even poor guy Lucifer can transport himself through the tunnel into a, a different point of our galaxy or a universe or possibly even to another neighboring universe just to escape the adjud adjudication <laughs> times that are approaching according to the Urantia book and according to many other spiritual, metaphysical, uh, revelatory uh, and contactee sources. So, uh, w of course this is totally a speculation, a uh, mental gymnastics so to speak. But still, we have to try to penetrate as deep as our mental capacities allow us and try to uh, bring into one total picture all these uh, diverse uh, happenings, uh, technological black project happenings on our planet. Uh, I would like to have your opinion on, 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 on this uh, speculation of mine, this attempt to summarize uh, the Phoenix and the Philadelphia project and the long alien presence on the planet with some of these ruling secretive hierarchies, uh, super material celestial hierarchies around the planet. What would you all think about these things? I think there's some good ideas there. Um, if you consider this thing from a celestial standpoint and who may be running the show at a still higher level, I think it's uh, very cogent and very real. And I do think, looking at some tons of books and material that's been available, that uh, there is enough material available to support the idea of a complete web, a spider web, if you will, of interlocking directorates, interlocking think tanks, and uh, people on this planet who take their orders from one institute as to how things are going to go here. Now, the big question is, and of course, most of these people, like... Uh, Who's pulling the strings? Who, who right, exactly. Because exactly. this is on the terrestrial material earthly level. Exactly. But obviously, this institute interfaces somewhere, as Stan Dale in his uh, brilliant book, Cosmic Conspiracy, says, right. that uh, some of the members of the Illuminati Politburo border on the paranormal, as uh, I think Alan Dulles said, Please. in their attempt to identify these people. Obviously, these are... Uh, extraterrestrial alien or spiritual being members that materialize for the Politburo meeting and then dematerialize yeah. and that's why the FBI and the CIA cannot uh, locate them. Well, I can say flatly from people I've known who are connected with you order the Illuminati that they aren't bordering on unusual abilities. They have them or they're not a member of that organization. They have to be able to see through time. They have to be able to uh, demonstrate extraordinary psychic abilities, remote viewing and all of this sort of thing, and what else, I don't know. But those abilities must be there. They must be able to demonstrate their use at any time, and of course, for what purpose? The purpose has to be to communicate with somebody off-planet. All the inputs I have say that the Order of the Illuminati is a top dog organization on this planet which interfaces with outside. And it, they and it has done so for the last 5,000 years. 10,000 from what I understand. And uh, uh, the outside aliens that come to the planet are themselves subjected to these hierarchical levels of intelligences, of attainment levels of uh, management, where the more advanced races and uh, civilizations uh, tutor, manage, or control the lower ones. And so basically, uh, they are subcontractors of higher levels of contractors that are again subcontractors to higher levels and so on until we reach the very pinnacle of, of this uh, celestial pyramid. That's why I consider the Urantia book net not as the ultimate source, but as one of the extremely important sources in trying to elucidate the secrets of uh, the higher management levels of one of the power centers that runs our universe. Right. That I'll agree with because you have evident uh, at least two different celestial systems, two different uh, theologies. And we have two more minutes. As, as to who is going to run what. According to the Rancher book, you have the uh, 
Trinitarian Trinitarians, hierarchy. who, of course, are now thoroughly embedded in the Catholic Church and others who believe in the Holy Trinity. This is one of their symbols. And you must accept the authority of this group, and it goes on up, of course, through the hierarchy. But you then have the Luciferians who believed in and rebelled against God, so to speak, in the uh, Trinitarian operation because of the fact they believed in the public and the individuals having some right of free choice. And this is what our Constitution is based on, the right of free choice. And there are some people who have traced, of course, the Masonic Order and those who were all part of it at the time of the signing of the Constitution. But many of these people might have some, uh, quote, Luciferian connections, unquote, and in terms of the uh, then accepted religious orders. Well, they were Masons, and they, of course we know the Masons go to a higher level in the 33rd degree. They do go to a 37th degree. And this, this is the final minute here. Yeah. So Paul, we have to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Yeah. And I think this is a brilliant topic for our next discussion. And probably it would be a nice idea to call Ted Gunderson uh, as a leading authority here in Los Angeles yeah. and the United States and probably the world on satanic cult and satanic abuse uh, in order to further discuss the presence of the Luciferian yeah, right. uh, operation on this planet. You know, the satanic cults and the use of kids for their sacrifices and worships is much more widespread than most people believe, and what the true significance of this is is probably a subject for discussion which would go on for hours. Uh, but your feeling is that all these underground black project operations in cooperation with aliens that the level of aliens that you personally have interfaced in, uh, in, in, in your presence in the underground, that these are just the, lower, the lowest levels of creatures yeah. that uh, contact us and that there are many other higher levels of hierarchies that control them. Very true. There are other levels that are far beyond those of the reptilians and people who perhaps were the actual precursors of humanity ages and ages ago and they keep way in the background and they don't interfere unless something is absolutely necessary to interfere about. And they have the power, and they just don't exert it unless it is absolutely essential. Unless we are on the verge of blowing the whole planet, as was done on numerous occasions by many of our alien tutoring races, even <laughs> it happened in our solar system when the planet beyond Mars, between Mars and Jupiter, was blown in a fiery explosion more than 100,000 years ago. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, your time and your attention uh, coming to you directly from the American Academy of Dissident Sciences. This is the uh, third underground interview with Al Bilik and Vladimir Terzinski and we will be happy to bring you in the future more and more interesting topics of discussion. Uh, thank you very much and have a good night.